welcome back. We're going to look at everything that you need to know for topic one, stoichiometric relationships, while studying for the IB exam. So this is just a brief overview. If you want more in-depth problem-solving videos, check out my channel. There are other videos there. Again, this is just a brief overview that goes through all of the concepts that you need to remember while studying for the IB exam. So topic one, we are looking at stoichiometric relationships. We need to remember the very basic formula for any chemical reaction has the reactants on the left, yields, products. That arrow means yields or forms products. Example of a chemical equation could be the formation of water, which would be hydrogen plus oxygen yields H2O. And don't forget, because of the law of conservation of mass, we need to balance any chemical equation that we're given. That means that we need to count the atoms on either side of the equation and make sure they add up here. So if I look at my oxygen, I have two on this side, one on this side. So I'm gonna put a coefficient of two here so that balances out my oxygens. But this two is attached to everything in that formula. So two times two is four, so I have four hydrogens on my right-hand side, and I need to make four on my left-hand side, so I put a coefficient of two on the left hand. And again, the reason we balance equations is because of the law of conservation of mass. Anytime we have a chemical reaction like this, like oxygen and hydrogen combining to make water, that is known as a chemical change. Hydrogen and oxygen both changed chemically to make a new product, water. There are times in chemistry where things are not combined chemically, and those would be known as mixtures. Mixtures are when two or more substances are in the same place at the same time. They're interspersed within each other, but they're not chemically combined. So the two different types of mixtures that we have are homogeneous mixtures, homogeneous mixtures, and heterogeneous mixtures. Remember, a homogeneous mixture has a uniform composition, meaning if you um, cut it up, it would be the same all the way through. Heterogeneous mixtures do not have a uniform composition, which means if you cut it into pieces, every piece would be different. So for a homogeneous mixture, um, an example would be something like milk. You cannot tell the separate layers apart from each other. A heterogeneous mixture would be something like cookie dough. If you drink a glass of milk, every drink tastes the same. It has a uniform composition. If you eat a bite of cookie dough, if you eat a whole bowl of cookie dough, you would feel sick, of course, but every bite could have a different number of like chocolate chips in it if you had chocolate chip cookie dough. There's no uniformity throughout. We need to remember our states of matter as well. We have solids, liquids, and gases. And all of these are reversible states. So solids can form liquids or gases. Liquids can form solid or gases, and gases can form liquids or solids. The major difference between these three is how the particles are arranged. Solid particles are really close together, barely moving. They have a fixed shape and a fixed volume. So fixed shape and a fixed volume. Liquids are more spread out. The particles are moving faster than in solids, and they have a fixed volume, but no fixed shape. They take the shape of their container. Gases, the particles are very spread out, moving very quickly, and they have no fixed shape and no fixed volume. They take the shape and volume of their container. And of course, don't forget your state symbols, S, L, G, and we do have a Q as well, which means aqueous, which means something dissolved in water. 
Topic one is all about stoichiometric relationships, which means there will be a lot of calculations. And the calculations are centered around a few conversion factors. So Avogadro's number is a very important number in chemistry, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. That number is significant because it tells us the number of particles in one mole of a substance. So one mole is equal to 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles. And that would not be a very useful conversion factor on its own, but we also know that one mole is equal to the molar mass of a substance. And this mass is found straight on the periodic table. So for example, if I wanted to know what one mole of carbon was made up of, I know it has 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms, and I know that it weighs 12.01 grams based off of the mass on the periodic table. So very useful conversion factor. And if we want to know the molar mass of something like a molecule, like H2O, all that we do is take all of the masses in that compound and add them together. So I have two hydrogens, so 1.01 plus 1.01 plus one oxygen is 15.99, or we could say it's about 16. And the mass of H2O would be about 18.02 grams. And I took all of that information straight from the periodic table. So the periodic table will be your best friend in any stoichiometric problem solving. And again, these are basic definitions. If you want to see problems solved, check out some other videos on my channel. When solving stoichiometric problems, um, the first step, of course, is writing out and balancing your equation. But we also need to determine what is the limiting reactant. The limiting reactant is the reactant that limits the amount of product the reactant that limits the amount of product that can be formed. So for example, if I have A plus B yields C plus D, here's my products, one of these reactants will be limiting, meaning one of them will be used up faster than the other one. And when one of them is used up, the reaction is over, it can no longer take place. So that reactant limits the amount of products that can be formed. So one of these will be the limiting reactant and the other one we would say is left in excess. There's extra left over. Anytime that you're solving a stoichiometric problem, you're solving for the theoretical yield. The theoretical yield. The theoretical yield is the maximum amount of product that could be formed. The maximum amount of, amount of product that could be formed in a perfect scenario. And of course we know after working in IB labs throughout the year that the theoretical yield is not always attainable. It's very rare that at the end of a lab, you would have the amount of product that you predicted at the beginning based on stoichiometry. The real amount of product that's formed is called the actual yield. And that is the amount that was obtained in the lab, the amount of product formed experimentally. The amount of product formed experimentally. We can compare these two yields by looking at the percent yield where we take the actual yield over the theoretical yield times 100, and that will tell us how efficient our reaction was. So if you had a percent yield of around 90%, that would be a very efficient experiment. You have a high percent yield. Almost all of your reactants were made into products. You didn't have very much reactant that was lost. The last part of topic one goes over the gas laws. The first gas law is Avogadro's law. 
and what his law says is that for equal volumes of gases measured at the same temperature and the same pressure, there will be the same number of particles. So if I have a constant temperature and pressure, equal volumes of gases will have the same equal volume of gas. Any gas, all gas, will have the same number of particles. So I can say that volume is directly related to N, which is the number of moles of gas. We also have Boyle's law, which relates pressure and volume. And what his law says is that P1 V1 equals P2 V2, or pressure one, volume one equals pressure two, volume two. Then we have Charles' law, and he relates volume and temperature. He says volume one over temperature one equals volume two over temperature two. And we can combine these into one larger law and say P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2. And remember, according to Avogadro's law, if pressure and temperature are held constant, then the volume, a given volume, should have the same number of moles of a gas. So we could also say P1 V1 over T1 is directly proportional to the number of moles in your gas. And we can make this into one larger equation, which is known as the ideal gas law, by introducing a constant, R. So PV equals NRT, where P, of course, is pressure. V is volume. N is the number of moles. R is the gas constant. And T is the temperature in Kelvin. So R is equal to 8.31 joules per Kelvin per mole. And again, that value is also found in the IB data booklet. And this just relates pressure, volume, temperature and the number of moles together in one large formula, which does come in handy. The last important thing to take from topic one is concentration. And it is really important to know how to obtain concentration, um, working with equilibrium and acid bases and all other types of questions. So concentration in general is going to be the amount of something over the volume that it's in. So amount over volume. And if we take our normal units that we use in this chemistry class, amount is going to be in moles, volume is going to be in decimeters cubed. So concentration is equal to moles over volume, N over V. And of course, we can rearrange this formula if we ever need to solve for the number of moles, N equals CV, concentration times volume. And that will come in handy. Um, just a few other things to mention. Volume, of course, is always in decimeters cubed. If you're given centimeters cubed, you'll just divide that number by 1,000, which will give you decimeters cubed. Temperature needs to be in Kelvin. Amount will always be moles. Mole is for amount. Pressure is in pascals. And those are just some units to remember. So this was just a brief overview of everything in topic one. If you want more in-depth information or in-depth problem solving, check out some other videos on my channel.